o'clock on the dot. Thank you, sir, for bringing us in strong that way. So how many of you ha are familiar with the six personal perspectives? A few hands, great. So um, I have to tell you, last week I was in Austin and my leadership team and I were able to take the Leadership Academy class that Gary has just rolled out in the last few months. There's a full day with Gary and then a full day with Jason and Jay Papasan. And it is hands down, since Quantum Leap, in my opinion, the greatest class that I've taken. I can't tell you how long. Get thee to that class. It's Servant Productivity Leadership. It's remarkable. Gary reminded us all. Um, of how important training for our people is and how important our training calendar is. But we talked a lot about the importance of the six personal perspectives. And Jay and Jason, it was so cool to hear them talk about how for years and years and years, every single meeting, every single meeting and the beginning of every single piece of KWU curriculum started with a crash course on the six personal perspectives. Maybe only they only spent five minutes on it, but every class started with it. So I thought what better um, way to spend our week together than with the class and the um, perspectives that Gary just feels is most important for all of us to do time and time and time again. So I'm glad you've done it before. I hope this week it um, is something new and fresh because we're different people all the time. We're always growing, we're changing, and we can approach the perspectives in a new fresh, fresh way in terms of how we're approaching our family and our business and our community. So with that said, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll jump in. Jump in. Um, so it's uh, the six personal perspectives are the foundational perspectives to propel you to the highest level of achievement. Um, and we talk about this a lot. Um, what, what, are, what is it that differentiates those who achieve at the highest level from those who don't seem to accomplish quite as much? And it really boils down to mindset, attitudes, and their approach to life. Notice it actually didn't say anything about lead generation, but we'll get to that part. <laughs> but it's mindset, attitudes, and approach to life. Because when we have all of that taken care of, um, then the rest of that's going to fall into place in exactly the right way for it to feel um, really connected to who we are and how our business needs to run. So Gary has said that when you interview the very top people and ask them what their biggest challenge is, invariably the top people are going to tell you that it's mindset, keeping it focused, keeping it strong, keeping it positive amid the many challenges they encounter every day on their way to the top. Gary goes on to say that life is an inside to the outside experience. Sounds familiar. Um, he says that when you get this at a deep level, you realize that who you are inside determines and drives what you are outside. The very best achievers know this and therefore truly work on and protect their mindset. Literally last week, Gary stood in front of us and he said, if you work to be a better person, you're going to have a better business. And it's just an inside to the outside job that we all get to do. So let's quickly go through the six perspectives here. Step one is commit to self-mastery. I'm going to nail it. I'm going to master this. I'm going to just throw in like who I was pre six personal perspectives. Do I have your, permi your permission to show you like Vanessa pre six PP? Okay. So commit to um, self mastery was not total drinking problem, had no control over it. Nowhere near self mastery when it came to my abuse of alcohol. Step two, commit to the 80-20 principle. So this is focusing on your big rocks. I was a single agent for seven years. I literally had to do everything. I had to design the brochures. I had to put it on Zillow. I had to show every house. I did not know what the most important 20% for me was at all. 
Step three, move from E to P. So this is from entrepreneurial to purposeful and being purposeful about breaking through your ceiling of achievement. So for me, I had been stuck at that eight to $10 million range for like six, seven years, could not break through it. Step four is ma make being learning based the foundation of your action plan, right? That we'll, we are always willing to be taught, that we are always pursuing learning. And y'all, me, I was such a know-it-all. I mean, I still struggle with it, but like literally it was like, oh, I've got this. I don't need to learn anything else. I know exactly how to do this. And didn't, was not, at, I didn't read books. It, it, I just was not at all learning-based. So step five is removing your limiting beliefs that you can unlimit your thinking, which will unlimit your success. And my limiting belief was, well, I have a BFA in dance. I'm an artist. There's no way I can run a big business. I shouldn't actually be in business at all. That was my limiting belief. And then finally was be accountable, that it's mine and I own it, right? So for me, for years, and this ties back to my issues at step one, was I blamed everyone around me and I blamed my circumstances. And I, I just pointed the finger at everyone else for why things were the way they were in my life. I didn't realize that it was mine to own and I could write that story. So how many of you have seen this TED Talk at the beginning of um, this class? And I can't see you all. So I don't know if anybody. Okay, so let's see here. I really want us to take, and I know we only have 13 minutes, um, but I want to take the time for y'all to watch this because it sets us up for the rest of the week um, and really helps us to frame out the perspectives. So Kelly, I can see you. Give me a thumbs up once I push play and tell me if you can hear it, please. Okay. Imagine a big explosion on feet. Imagine a plane full of smoke. Imagine an engine going clack, 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 clack. Sounds scary. Well, I had a unique seat that day. I was sitting in 1D. I was the only one who could talk to the flight attendants. So I looked at them right away, and they said, no problem. We probably hit some birds. The pilot had already turned the plane around, and we weren't that far. You could see Manhattan. Two minutes later, three things happen at the same time. The pilot lines up the plane with the Hudson River. It's usually not the route. <laughs> he turns off the engines. Now imagine being on a plane with no sound. And then he says three words, as unemotional three words have I ever heard. He says, brace for impact. I didn't have to talk to the flight attendant anymore. <laughs> I could see in her eyes. It was terror. Life was over. And I want to share with you three things I learned about myself that day. I learned that it all changes in an instant. We have this bucket list. We have these things we want to do in life. And I thought about all the people I wanted to reach out that I didn't. All the fences I wanted to mend. All the experiences I wanted to have and I never did. As I thought about that, later on I came up with a saying, which is, I collect bad wines. Because if the wine is ready and the person is there, I'm opening it. I no longer want to postpone anything in life. And that urgency, that purpose has really changed my life. The second thing I learned that day, and this is as we um, clear the George Washington Bridge, which was by not a lot, I thought about, wow, I really feel one real regret. I've lived a good life in my own humanity and mistakes. I've tried to get better at everything I've tried. But in my humanity, I also allow my ego to get in. And I regretted the time I wasted in things that did not matter with people that matter. I thought about my relationship with my wife, with my friends, with people. 
And after, as I reflected on that, I decided to eliminate negative energy from my life. It's not perfect. It's a lot better. I've not had a fight with my wife in two years. It feels great. I'm no longer trying to be right. I choose to be happy. The third thing I learned, and this is as your mental clock starts going 15, 14, 13, you can see the water coming. I'm saying, please blow up. Right? I don't want this thing to break in 20 pieces like you've seen in those documentaries. And as we're coming down, I had a sense of, wow, dying is not scary. It's almost like we've been preparing for it our whole lives. But it was very sad. I didn't want to go. I love my life. And that sadness really framed in one thought, which is, I only wish for one thing. I only wish I could see my kids grow up. About a month later, I was in a performance by my daughter, first grader, not much artistic talent, <laughs> yet. <laughs> and I'm bawling, I'm crying like a little kid. And it made all the sense in the world to me. I realized at that point, by connecting those two dots, that the only thing that matters in my life is being a great dad. Above all, above all, the only goal I have in life is to be a good dad. I was given the gift of a miracle of not dying that day. I was given another gift, which was to be able to see into the future and come back and live differently. I challenge you guys that are flying today, imagine the same thing happens on your plane, and please don't. But imagine, and how would you change? What would you get done that you're waiting to get done because you think you'll be here forever? How would you change your relationships and the negative energy in them? And more than anything, are you being the best parent you can? Thank you. Rick learned three things that day. Um, that he doesn't want to wait to enjoy anything. He's fully present now. That he doesn't let things get in the way with people who matter that he doesn't need to be right, he wants to be happy, and that he wants to be a good dad. So it's a powerful perspective, and I want each of us to think for this week, how would you change? What would you do that you're waiting to get done because you're gonna, you think you're gonna be here forever? What would you do that you're waiting to get done because you think you have all the time in the world? So I do want you to, for this week, think about one thing that you'd like to accomplish in your life. And I want you to keep that in your head and your heart throughout the week. Every morning, this is what we're gonna go back to. Now, it could be that you, it could be business related, right? That you want to get to a certain sales volume or family served within the team. It could be that you want to run a marathon. Um, it could have to do with time spent with your family or a trip that you want to take. I want it to be powerful and meaning for you. What would you like to accomplish in your life? that if you were on that plane and it didn't go the way it went, right? That you, you've accomplished it. You've been able to do that. Now, often um, we've had that goal for a long time. This isn't the first time we've talked about it or you thought about it. It's not a new idea. So we need to do a reality check um, on what that goal is, and, but, how are you doing with that so far? And how do you feel about how you're doing pertaining to that? And then what does your future look like if it doesn't happen? What does your world look like if you don't accomplish that? So the next two days, we're going to tackle two perspectives per day, going through self-mastery and 80-20 tomorrow, then E to P and learning based on Wednesday, and then Thursday will be living beliefs and be accountable. 
But I think it's important that we open it up right now for some ahas and just for everybody to share maybe what that goal for you, what you want to accomplish, what you're going to hold on to for this week. Because um, remember, aha is agents helping agents. And I think that when we share with each other, we're going to help each other to understand that we're not alone. Um, in what might be really small or might be really big, it all matters. I love that Rick said, he said, I don't focus on uh, things that don't matter with people that do matter, right? So with that, let me open it up. Who's got ahas or things that they want to focus on for this week to share? Vanessa, I had one that hit me like a ton of bricks on that previous slide. Yeah. It was, what's your goal? But the last question was, how is your life going to be different? Um, yeah. You know, how is it going to change your life? And I was thinking about the goals that I might have and um, whether my life would actually be different if I yeah. accomplished it. Like when you're thinking about your goal, it's yeah. so important to sit there because I said, oh, well, if I did this, but no, my life would still, ultimately it would be the same. Like, is it tied to a production number? Maybe, maybe because maybe I can change dramatically, change the world of everyone around me. Maybe I can, but yeah. maybe my life isn't really different. Maybe I don't feel different. I feel like it has to be at your core and in your soul too. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate you so much. Love you for going first. <laughs> What else, y'all? Hey, Vanessa. Uh, so, you know, I think of what is it that you'd like to accomplish in your life? And when I think about that, I think of like, okay, what's the, what's the ultimate end game of, for my family and I? Like, what is it that we want to have from all of the real estate business, from all of the experiences? I mean, my daughter's six. And so it's, you know, and I think to myself, okay, and I was talking to my coach about this of that the goal is really a, the journey. Like, what is it the journey that you want to have on getting to the place that you want to be? Because the goal, it tends to be static and not necessarily like, I'm going to go reach this thing. Yeah. Um, and so when I think about that, I think of how do I want this experience of the goal to go? How do I want to feel about this on my way for my family to achieve, you know, this, you know, the extreme life, like the 200% life that we want yeah. to live. And, um, you know, and so that's, I think, some reflection that I'm going to have to have a little bit more on. And I think I, we, we've been going through the 12 week year and with my coach and with, um, you know, the whole maps thing that they do with that. And it, it changes. It's changed like five times in the last five years. Like every year I have to redo it because the journey is now different. Yeah. And what the perspective is now different. So that's kind of what I think about um, and what my focus is going to be is yeah. like that, that life and the journey on how to get there. Thank you for sharing that, Jake. I couldn't agree more. And um, we talked a lot in Gary's class last week about <clears throat> purpose and somebody in the class raised their hand and said, what's the difference between purpose and goal, right? And we were able to have a nice conversation about how... I see purpose as the title of your life's novel, right? It is the overarching theme of your life. And I, I agree that, um, that it is about journey. It's about uh, the totality of your life and the experience that you're having all along the way. And then goals are the chapters, right? Because they have a finite beginning and an end. Um, and so we can bring that to each chapter, but we can also bring it to the total journey and to... Um, our whole life's mission. Um, and just like Rick said in the TED Talk, um, he doesn't want to wait to enjoy anything. Um, and that that is about process and being present in the day-to-day. -day. Um, thank you for sharing that. One more, it's 819, then we gotta go crush it. One more. People are being a little shy on a Monday morning. Good morning, V. Good morning. 
All right. So, um, so I would, I would answer that question differently today than I would have this time last week. And the reason why is I just um, finished my first round of Project U. Amazing. Um, so uh, it gave me a whole different perspective. Frankly, I don't really fully understand what to do with it yet. Um, <sighs> and our homework leading there was to start by being more aware, to start by being more aware of the moments that you're in, things that you can and can't control, and really how much more control it gives you in your life when you stop trying to control things that you can't control and to not allow yourself to be triggered by it. So if I were going to answer that question today, what is my goal? I would say to be more present, to allow myself and give myself permission to be more present in the moments that I'm in, whether they would be described as a moment that's causing stress or anger or happiness or what have you, to be present in the moment um, and the emotions or whatever that's being experienced during that time is intended for that. And if I don't let it take me over, then actually you're experiencing it more wholly. That's the whole 100% inside and outside. And again, I'm still learning. I have a massive learning journey ahead. But what I would say is what is the goal is to really just start being more present in the moment that I'm in and to not allow um, myself to get triggered by things that I can't control and to just say, this is happening for a reason. And uh, you know, so that, that's what I would say. And I don't even know how to fully define this, but I, I think that definition is coming. I love that you're letting that rattle around in your head and heart. Yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Hold on to that for the next few days as we go through this. Um, and we walk through all the perspectives together. So it's 821. Thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Eastern, bright and early. We'll dive into self-mastery. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, V. one and I want to jump in. Thank you all so much for tuning in this week. It really means a lot to me that you showed up again today, knowing what we were doing for the week. <laughs> so with your permission, because this is so much content, I'm probably going to go over today. If you need to leave at 820, please don't hesitate just to exit the Zoom. And yet, um, if you want to go back and catch the tail end of it on the recording, they will record till the end. Um, but we're really wanting to get through two perspectives today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Um, and that's just, it, it takes a minute to get through it. So I appreciate you being with me and I appreciate um, the extra time at the end as needed. So the first of the six personal perspectives is a commitment to self-mastery. Um, and all that really means is knowing yourself right? Knowing if you're a recovering perfectionist, knowing what you need to know about yourself. So the greatest leaders in across all industries, really, they have one common trait. And it's not the same disc. It's not the same KPA. It is not the same strength finder. It's self-awareness. And when you're aware of who you are, how you are wired up, then you can go on the journey of self-mastery. Um, and so self-mastery really is, and y'all can see my screen. Yeah, Nick, I can see you. Okay, good. Um, self-mastery is the possession of great knowledge, skills, and habits that make you the master of you. So we need habits. Let's look at that one for just a second. Um, in all kinds of forms, we need um, reality habits. We need mindset habits. We need action habits. Um, but really, it is this idea of self-mastery, knowing yourself, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, and being humble enough to move in a direction that grows you into the master of you as it pertains to your strengths and as it pertains to your weaknesses. Weaknesses in my, my mind are not a bad thing when we have awareness around them, when we're willing to partner with people who fill that gap, and when we're willing to um, not allow those weaknesses to hold us back. 
So there's a great book called Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell, y'all have heard of that. So in the book, he talks about how it's 10,000 hours to get to mastery. If you really boil that down to a 40 hour week, that would be about five years of working at something before you get to mastery. Y'all, I've been in real estate for 18 years now, and I am so not a master. So mastery is a journey. It takes time. I also have been on a journey personally like I told you yesterday, to master myself in so many different ways. But it really, it really, when I took Quantum Leap and the six personal perspectives are inside of it for the first time, I realized I had not mastered myself in terms of addictive behaviors. And I needed to slow down and really master me. I needed to know that I could be the best mom, wife, woman of faith and business owner that I could possibly be in the way that my creator had wired me up to to be. And so the first step for me for in self mastery was to quit drinking. I knew that if I could master that, then I'd actually be able to stack other good habits on top of it. But that was the first thing I needed to master. So I'm so excited to say that July 23rd will be 11 years of sobriety and over the course of those 11 years, that's where I've been able to stack the habit of understanding how my brain works, understanding how to best fuel my body, understanding how to structure my day for my best production, and understanding the kind of business that I wanted to build that would allow me to master real estate in the way that plays up my strengths and my weaknesses. So I do wonder if you can put those pieces together know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and know how you're going to work with both of them to reach your goal, thinking back to the goal from yesterday. So again, knowledge, skills, and habits that make one the master of a subject. Now, again, I'm going to say it again. I feel like I'm a master of nothing. It is a journey though, and I am grateful to be on that journey. So let's put the, the pieces together here. What are three strengths that you possess that are going to help you get to your goal, right? For me, when it came to my business and I knew that I wanted to have a business that made a positive impact in the world, I knew that I was strong with people, I was strong with design, and I was strong with generosity, right? But I knew that I had then, next question, what are three obstacles that might hinder your achievement of your goal? I knew that I had the obstacle of addiction that was going to hold me back from being the best version of myself in life and in business. So what are your strengths and what are the things that might hinder you from achievement of that goal? And then what are your weaknesses that might hinder you from overcoming the obstacles, right? So I had the weakness of knowing that I hate sales. Y'all, we're in real estate. I hate sales. When I acknowledged that that was my weakness, I then realized, am I drinking because I'm embarrassed to be in sales? And I got, I started unpacking all of it. So I had to then say, how do I build, build a business model that overcomes my desire to succeed in business, but in a way that feels like service, in a way that takes great care of people, in a way that makes a difference. And I had to acknowledge that um, that was the journey that I needed to be on and um, acknowledge, acknowledge that I was in sales, um, but that I was going to turn it into service, right? So it's about a commitment to self-mastery. Um, and for me, that's what led to the Care, Serve, Give business model. If you haven't taken that whole training within Livian, I really, really hope that you will. Just email me, Vanessa at Livian.com. I'll send it all to you. But the self-mastery brought out that business model. And we're going to save ahas to the end because we're already going over. Next uh, perspective is committing to the 80-20 principle. Now, we all know that there is a pattern of predictable imbalance in life. It is called the 80-20 principle. And that is a good pattern when you know it and when you can structure your world around it. So all this means is that your 20% are your big rocks in life, right? They're your big priorities. They're the most important things for you to focus on. 
they come first, right? So there's this great story about a uh, philosophy professor who sits down in front of his class and he puts a big jar in front of the class and he fills it with big rocks all the way to the top. And he says to the class, is the jar full? And they're like, yeah, it's full. He says, wait a minute, now, let me pour some pebbles in. He pull, pours pebbles in, fills all the gaps in the jar. And then he asks the question, the class again, is the jar full? They're like, oh yeah, yeah, now it's full. Then he pours sand in. That fills the gaps even more. Asking the class, now is the jar full? And now they're like, oh, this is always a trick question. What do I say? <laughs> they're like, yes. And then last but not least, he fills it with water, the whole thing with water and says, okay, now we can agree that the jar is full. But then he pulls out another jar and he lays in front of it, um, big rocks, pebbles, sand, and a pitcher of water. And he pours the water in first. And then he pours the sand in. And then he pours the pebbles in. And when he pours the pebbles in, the water starts spilling out. He, he doesn't even have room for the big rocks. There's, no, there's absolutely nothing left. There's no space. There's no margin. So obviously the jar is our life. It's symbolic of our life. And if we don't know what our priorities are, and yes, this is business, but this is family. This is our partners, our beloveds, our spouses, uh, the important relationships in our life and the, the priorities across our whole life. If we don't put that in our jar first, there's not going to be room for it because the world is going to decide what you're supposed to fill your jar with unless you decide for yourself and you put that into your jar from the very beginning. So when we're focused on the 20% that matters, we then actually get 80% of the results we want. 20% effort, the big rocks, equals 80% results. You'll make more money. You'll have more time with family. You'll be more organized because what matters the most to you is showing up in your world first. Remember what we heard about the TED Talk with Rick Elias. He said that he was going to focus on what matters the most and stop worrying about things that don't matter anymore. So Extreme Pareto is this, he's a philosopher and you'll look him up. It's all about taking your 20% and then going even smaller to find new vital, the vital few of the vital few, right? And so there's this book, maybe you've heard of it. It's called The One Thing. Um, if you haven't read it, highly recommend it. Again, this is so applicable to every aspect of your life. And the example on the screen with the 80-20 principle is actually about running a marathon. So go back to that goal that you established yesterday. Maybe the goal was to run a marathon. So you write that down and you make a success list instead of a to-do list because this determines your 20%. And you write down everything you need to do to run that marathon. Work a diet, work um, on a diet plan, um, work on your hydration plan, um, decide on a strength program, select your running regimen, and then find a compatible running group. Well, then you got to decide what's the 20% of that list. Well, the running regimen. So then that goes to the top of the next list, and then you unpack that, and then you unpack that, and then you unpack that. So if you haven't read that book in a while, highly recommend. Um, and then how do we take this over to our every day? Well, it really is about time blocking, right? It really is about knowing what our goal is and then knowing how we're going to accomplish that goal on a daily and on a weekly and on a monthly basis. Um, so who's using the 411 as a planning tool within your team? Anybody? Okay, great. Look, uh, my team has a love-hate relationship with it, right? I think let's all be honest. It is such a like one sheet of accountability and we're not even to the accountability perspective yet. But if you write it down, then all, all of a sudden it's gonna become reality. And yet that's exactly what we want is the clarity for ourselves and our team members about what our big rocks are, what our 20% are. 
And the peace that comes with that is inexplicable. If you have reviewed your entire team's 411 for July, and you know that your chief of staff is working on A, B, and C for the first couple of weeks, and your director of client service is working on that project in the business, and your um, lead agent is working on this in the business, and you know what you're working on in the business, you've all shared that, everyone can take an exhale. Everyone can breathe easy because we know with clarity and certainty what our focus is and that they're all working in cohesion. But it really does take everyone doing that together. But here's another truth. People think there's never enough time to be successful, but there is when you do this time block. And then you acknowledge and you help each other with that time block. So be consistent enough to set the habit, be thoughtful and purposeful about what you put on that 411 and on your time block, and always put the big rocks on first. They always come first. And then we just all live by if you erase it, you must replace it, right? So if your goal is running that marathon, and it is that running program that you've put into place, and something happens where you have to erase a session, where do you replace it? Life happens. You're going to need to reschedule things. That's okay. Take a deep breath. Just because you erased it doesn't mean that the whole week or month is you just give up. It just means where do you replace it on your schedule? So you're going to continually refer back to your 411 with your big rocks for the month. And spoiler alert, it's going to get boring in a really beautiful way. Because every month you're going to go, Oh, right. My 20% is pretty much the same every month, isn't it? <laughs> My priorities haven't changed. What I'm focusing on hasn't really changed. There's going to be nuances to it, but the magic's going to happen in the mundane, right? The magic's going to happen when that typical day keeps showing up and you keep executing on it, and then you're achieving your goals even that much faster and faster and faster. So the truth is the world doesn't know your purpose or your priorities, and they aren't responsible for your priorities. You are. Let me repeat that. The world doesn't know your purpose and priorities, and the world is not responsible for them. You are. You are responsible for maintaining your time block, your goals, your priorities. You know, when you just get pulled into email and all of a sudden you're just, you've just lost an hour to replying to everyone else's priority. That's not your priority. You're, you're responding to their purpose and priority, which we want to do, but in a predetermined time, once you have fulfilled your purpose and priorities for the day. So again, it's just how are you organizing your day so that you get those big rocks taken care of from the very beginning and you can rest assured that you know you did what you needed to do. Now, how are you gonna protect it? You build a bunker, right? So what do you need in terms of your space to be able to do your time block? Number two, store provisions, right? Like we were saying at the time, I've got my provisions. We've got our breakfast. We've got our coffee. We're ready to go. I, need, I don't need to go into the other room. We sweep for mines, right? Maybe we have to turn off certain apps, certain notifications, certain social media that sucks us in. Sweep for mines. Get, get all of that taken care of ahead of time. And then enlist support. What I mean by this is go back to the 411. Be very clear with your team on what your priorities are, what your time block looks like, and allow your team members to know that so that they can support you in it. So uh, I took three of our leaders to Gary's class last week, as I mentioned. Um, Heather is our director of client services, and we were listening to um, the 80-20 principle again, um, thinking about time blocking, and she turned to Elizabeth, our chief of staff, and she was like, okay, 
I am going to have Heather's happy hour right after our Monday morning meeting. Now, Heather's happy hour means that nobody calls her, nobody emails her, nobody talks to her, and that keeps Heather happy for an hour. <laughs> So she said, here is my hour after the meeting so I can organize what I heard, what our agents need, how I best support them. I can plan for my day and my week. And Heather's happy when nobody talks to me for that hour. That's now on our team calendar, Heather's happy hour. And we all know, keep Heather happy. Don't bug her. Let her focus on her big rocks for that time every Monday morning. That is what eliciting support looks like. So we did it with two minutes and then we can go over for people to share ahas um, and what you heard today that jumped out at you so that you can go into the day thinking about self-mastery and the 80-20. So who wants to jump in and, and share? Remember, ahas stands for agents helping agents. If you say it out loud, it's going to help somebody else here today. I love the big rocks uh, scenario. We've all heard that, but when you reversed it, I hadn't heard that before about, um, you know, there, there's your big rocks now sitting there and have not yep. been addressed or touched. That's and really, right. that's, uh, that visual is, that's pretty powerful visual. I think I'm going to really, I'm going to do that with the team. I think it's important to them to see that. Danny, I want you to grab the six personal perspectives teaching guide off of KW Connect um, and go through it at, with a, a teacher mindset. And I'm going to challenge you over the summer to teach all six perspectives to your team, because you'll see I'm just following the model. That story's in the curriculum. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Who else? Have a success list, not an action item list. Right. It's so clarifying. Can you say more? Do you know what you're going to apply that to? Well, yes, not only myself, but our team. Every, they, they all just come and say, I've got all this stuff to do. And I'm going to turn that around for them uh, to find out, like, let's prioritize that and let's take things off of it that don't even matter. Yeah. So the, the clarifying question from the one thing is, What's the one thing that you can do that by doing it, everything else becomes easier or doesn't matter? What is that one thing? And then the rest of it will fall into place from there. So I love that. Thank you. What else? Vanessa, I just wanted to share that I am bringing these perspectives to my team this week. So thank you so much. I am uh, emulating the CEO power up with my team all week long before our practice and role play. And so it's uh, I've taught this many times. And so it's a great uh, refresher and I love your uh, approach to it. So thank you. Thank you, Jake. I, I, my hope is that you'll all follow Gary's model, which is to go teach this to all of your teams. Danny's going to do it. Jake's going to do it. I want everybody to do it, right? Everybody has access to the curriculum on KW Connect. Um, and it would just, it's transformative for every team. Um, so I'm hoping that this is, yeah, just kind of a, a dress rehearsal in a way. So y'all can all go and do it. Okay, Dustin, bring us home and then we're going to go crush our day. Well, first of all, as a bull coach, you did an amazing job, Vanessa. Okay. So a lot of this material is just, it was like, it was like it being in a bowl room. So great job. Um, and I'll say the one thing that I took away from it but was just mastering repetitious boredom, right? There's there's gonna be times where it's not sexy. There's gonna be times where there's there's not a high for the day. And, you know, full disclosure, I struggle with a lot of the same things you talk about. And it's like, you're always looking for that next thing. And it's like, just accepting the fact that, you know what, there's going to be days when it's boring. It's yep. just going to have to be that, way, you know, and you, you just got to get through that, you know? So that was my big takeaway. Thank you, Dustin. I just, uh, as we land the plane for the day, what I'd love to share with you with y'all's permission is my cure for the boredom. Y'all okay if I... Sure. Okay. I truly believe when you find the higher purpose of your business and you wake up and you truly understand why you're doing the repetitive, boring things day after day after day, you will be able to show up 
with new energy and new excitement to the exact same thing time after time after time. And all this does is it goes back to the core values of Keller Williams. You go onto the KW website, you look up the values. It says God, family, business. KW is not going to tell anybody who God is, right? So like, let go of that. If people have baggage, I understand. But this is about you humbly saying, I've been created by the creator of the universe. So if I've been created to do something, I need to be super plugged into what that is. And when I figure out what I've been created to do, what the plan and purpose for my life is by the creator, the person who wired me up as an addict, as a creative, as a teacher, as a mom, as a recovering perfectionist, all the things that I was made to do, if I can truly figure that out and go live that out, then y'all, we can go negotiate another roof inspection. We can figure out how to help somebody get their water heater replaced. We can do another coaching conversation with our agents. We can host another event. We can, we can, we can, because when you know the higher purpose and the why behind your life, the magic shows up in the mundane and you actually start to really thrive on the mundane. So lean into your self-awareness. It all comes back to self-mastery and you really, really knowing you and why you're here. Um, and then, yeah, the magic's in the mundane. All right. I love you all. God loves you. Keller Williams loves you. Livian loves you. I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you right back here tomorrow morning. Mwah. We have so much AI here today and some rock stars here in person. I'm, I'm excited y'all are here this morning. Thanks again for um, coming in for day three of four days. So we've got two personal perspectives to dive into today. Um, and the the entrance ding dong is right now. Can y'all hear that through my screen or do you hear it? Yeah, okay. Um, but that's great. I'm thrilled people are joining us. Today, we're going to go through the next two perspectives, E to P and being learning-based. So let's jump in on E to P, get my slides up here for you and adjust your screen however you need to. Um, and let me be sure this is the right one. It is. Okay, so E to P is just about getting purposeful. Um, going from entrepreneurial to purposeful, but what that really means is going from what comes natural to you to getting really dialed in about it. Um, and you know, the, the good news here is that, um, we don't need a plane crash <laughs> to help us get purposeful, right? We watched Rick Elias at the very first, that's what spurred him into getting super purposeful about his life. But we don't, we don't have to have that. We can simply just follow the model. Um, so as I had expressed, um, day one, my aspects of my journey going E to P for me was having been a single agent who had topped out, hit my ceiling of achievement um, at about eight to 10 million a year. And I knew that I wanted my goal, going back to our goals, my goal was to be a light in the industry, to really be a change agent for care, for service, and for generosity. But I knew that I'd hit this ceiling of achievement and I was going to have to get purposeful about how to break through that. And so it, it becomes um, step one, focus, writing that goal down and figuring out what your 20% are. And we've already started that process. Then you're going to ask how it can be done. And are there different, better ways to do it? So for me, it really became a research project and getting very intentional about researching generosity within business models and saying, this isn't about how I feel about giving. I want the data and the research to back it up. And then looking for models to follow, attending trainings um, and finding and identifying mentors who've done it before. Well, how lucky am I? that Mo Anderson became my mentor. 
that she became the model for me to follow about generosity within a real estate business. Then you install systems, right? So it's time blocking. We've already talked about that. And then scripts, checklists, and making sure that the systems you install work consistently and efficiently. For me, that became codifying the care, serve, give model. I've got my wrinkly t-shirt on for you all today. But it, it meant getting very purposeful about what does this model look like in action on one piece of paper. And if you haven't taken the care, serve, give boot camp, just email me afterwards. We'll send you all the recordings and you can work through that. And literally install those systems into my business so that I knew that it would take me to the next level. And then bringing in accountability, which we're going to talk a lot more about. Um, that's our final perspective. But you want to be able to measure what you're doing and keep track of it um, on your 411 so that you know that you're moving towards that goal and getting purposeful about it. In doing that, for my business, I broke through that ceiling of achievement and was able to go from that eight to 10 million a year. And I'd hovered there for six or seven years and then getting super intentional about this. Last year, we closed 122 million. So the growth over time, and it's time on task over time, it did not happen overnight, but following that model and, and be letting the magic come from the mundane, like we talked about yesterday, um, it has really been the game changer for, for us. So that's E to P. Um, and I want to really just kind of fly through this because we haven't taken a lot of time to talk yet, and I'm hoping we'll be able to. So the fourth of the six personal perspectives is being learning-based and that it's the foundation of your action plan. Now, the good news is y'all are all learning-based because you're all here. <laughs> if this wasn't a part of who you are, I don't know that you would even be at Keller Williams, which is the number one training company across all industries for many, many years. And then the learning and the training is hardwired into us at Livian as the best of the best of Keller Williams. So I just like pat yourself on the back for showing up this morning and being learning based. Um, so when you're learning based, you're an individual who has made the decision to use effective learning as the foundational piece for your action plan to develop your life. Now, this is important. This is about, let me go to this next slide. Knowing for doing sake. Do you see that on the red side? Not knowing for knowing sake. There, I've definitely witnessed and experienced myself seasons where I like to learn, then I don't do anything about it. There's, I think, a bit of a tendency, even within our industry, to assume that if we attend a class or listen to a podcast or read a book, that we've checked the box. Oh, I did that. No, we actually acquired the knowledge. But what's important about being learning-based is then putting that knowledge into action, right? Putting it into your action plan for your life and for your business. So I love this um, kind of the, the four levels of competency. So our very first, you start the process at level one, which is unconscious incompetence. And at this level, you don't know what you don't know. For example, if you've never driven a car before, you have no idea how complicated it can be. Then you go to number two. If you acquire some knowledge, you move into conscious incompetence. So at level two, you know what you don't know. For example, you start to drive and you might figure out that parallel parking is a challenge, maybe not the easiest thing in the world, right? If you apply wisdom to that knowledge and you move to level three, you're at conscious competence. Now, in our example, this is when you become proficient at parallel parking, though you have to stop and focus, right? You line up the car, you look over your shoulder, you turn the wheel, you're watching all the angles, you're watching the curb, you're backing in, you're really, really watching and focusing on every step. 
And then over time with additional practice, your competence becomes a habit and you move into level four, which is unconscious competence, right? At this level, you could really just parallel park while you're singing a song on the radio, right? You're just, or, or you're talking on the phone and next thing you know, you're like, wait, I parked the car. <laughs> oh, I did that. And you're not even thinking about it. Um, and to attain unconscious competence in your big rocks, your 20% tasks, that is where you truly unlimit your success because these habits are no longer a challenge for you, just like the parallel parking. It just becomes your way of being. So what's really cool within Keller Williams and within Livian is that we actually have access again to some of the best curriculum in the industry. Um, and it's not hyperbole when I say that KW won um, top, oops, I just unplugged my computer, sorry guys. Um, won the top training organization across all industries for like four or five years in a row recently. And our curriculum truly is next to none. So high achievers reach their goals by making training, education, and self-development the foundational piece of their action plan. And we have launch, we have growth, we have achievement, we have all agents, uh, all levels of agent curriculum within KW. And then we also have it inside of Livian. So just remember what's super cool about being a part of this organization is you get to stack your market center training with the Livian training. And so you kind of can um, approach learning in so many, um, in, in both of those ways. Now, being learning-based as a foundation of your action plan can look like um, MAPS coaching, taking additional courses on KW Correct, Connect. If you're not going on on a regular basis and seeing the curriculum that they're rolling out there, please do. It is so robust. We, you don't need to invent anything. Um, you can just go there and, and learn. And then obviously the Millionaire Real Estate series. This curriculum put into action, these books, it's, it's absolutely incredible, the opportunity. Um, and then obviously the one thing, because we've talked about that in terms of how we're approaching our success list and our, our big rocks. So I want you to think about your learning plan and remember your goal. And be consciously incompetent. Be honest with yourself about what you don't know. And then really commit to learning. Now, if it's inside of the real estate business, I do want you to think strategically um, and leverage Livian and leverage KWU. And you can even think about it in terms of how you want to build your downline. We don't talk about that a ton in Livian, but as a reminder, if you're able to invite a guest through recruiting um, to a KWU curriculum class in your region, in your market center, or that you're even teaching, what a great opportunity not only to um, add to your team, um, but to, to add to your, to your downline. Now, I, it's interesting when I think about being learning based, I told you my goal to be a light in the industry and then going from E to P was really creating this model that I could just stick to a system that I could stick to that's based on research that's based on the data like Mo and I literally had the KWRI research department go study businesses that hardwire generosity into their operations to be sure that this was good business, right? So there's that piece of um, then wanting to always be learning about generosity, learning about what technology is in place that can help amplify that and being crystal clear on, on what we want those systems to be. And, and I knew after all of that research, that I wanted our business to be, um, to really do three things, um, to inspire generosity in our community, hence the events playbook, to inspire generosity in the next generation, hence closing for a cause, which are our closing donation gifts where we ask our clients to go talk to their kids about 
what breaks their heart and where they want their realtor to give back, get the kids thinking about giving because they'll grow up to be more generous. But then the third thing I wanted it to do was really satisfy the thing that broke my heart. Remember, I was saying yesterday, it's important for us to really think about the higher purpose of our business so that we feel connected to it, so that we want to wake up every day and do it again and again and again. And so the third piece of the generosity model is to have your impact initiative in place for your local team. So for us, we're going into our ninth school year with our impact initiative, which is our music initiative to make sure that every child in our school district has a band or orchestra instrument for rental for the school year. Those three things I learned actually build a big business and retain talent, including myself within an organization, because I went from E to P and got purposeful about doing the research and mapping out the system. And because I remained learning based, about what actually would work inside of the business. So then that's the overarching um, system that we have in place. But then on a personal level, you can take this into your personal life. Again, I think about the overarching goal to be a light in the industry, but what does that look like for me um, You know, outside of business and inside of business? It's to be radically inclusive, right? And to create um, a sense of belonging for as many people in our world as humanly possible. So I'm going from E to P currently in terms of wanting to be an expert about inclusion in the church. So I've got a whole book list that I'm reading through right now. So we go back to this book list. I've got one about that long for my personal um, e to P and being learning based around inclusivity. Um, and so I, I just say that because I think that um, there's layers to this in our life. It is both business and personal. But like we said the other day, you are you at midnight at 6.30 when you're heading to the gym, Rachel, when we're together at 8.15 a.m., when we're talking to our clients, when we're leading our teams, when we're watching TV with our spouse, when we're talking our kids in, you are you. And so finding ways to layer these perspectives in, in every aspect of your life, I think helps keep you um, feeling connected and having a holistic 200% life, like Adam says, right? 100% internal, 100% outside, um, but those two are completely connected. So those are our two steps, our two perspectives for today. Who wants to jump in and share ahas on E to P and or being learning based? Y'all can all unmute. Hey, Vanessa, it's Tom. Good morning, Tom. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. You know, through all of that, you didn't mention one time about how to sell a house. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> you know, it was all about working on ourselves. And a question I often ask when I'm coaching is, what do you really want? And many people just can't answer that. That's right. You know, so therefore... You know, it's about clarity, getting getting super clear on who you are and how you want to portray that to the world. So yeah, that's exactly great. right, Tom. Thank you. No, I didn't per I didn't mention selling a house, but I hope you all heard that by creating a model, a business model that was connected to my strengths, my weaknesses, um, how I feel I want to make a difference in the community, it's led to a lot of real estate sales. Right. So that is the ripple effect of um, following the six personal perspectives for sure. Vanessa, hey, Jake here. Amy, I um, feel you unmuting. Oh, Jake and then Amy. All right, cool. I mean, I love E2P, first of all. I feel like my business, where it is when I joined Libyan, I've been like banging on the ceiling as I'm breaking through into the next level of my business. And so the, um, 
it's just an interesting because it's who the reason I partnered with Livian was because I knew that that's the model that I could follow to then take my business from, you know, 20 million to 50 quickly and then beyond. Um, look, because it, that's what Gary tells us, right? Follow the model, find who's doing it, follow what they're doing. And that's, that's just, I've seen the same ceilings kind of you that you hit. I hit them and now I'm kind of breaking through the next one. There's always another ceiling on the other side of that. And I think it's just, it's interesting to know that and to kind of keep that into perspective. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. I, it reminds me of when I got inducted as a cultural ambassador in 2014, I wrote, I walked the big stage, you know, had the red sash on, sat down and felt so inspired and was like, wait, I just got it nominated for just doing what comes natural to me, right? Just doing what I, what I like to do, what feels good. But it was in that moment that I was like, what's going to happen when I get super purposeful about this? And it was literally sitting in the audience realizing, okay, bucket list, walk the big stage, be on the big stage at Mega Camp. Okay, how, what do I need to do next? And that really is what made me go, okay, I'm, I'm, instead of Cutco, I'm making these donations. How do I make that an actual system? And how do I put technology around it to make it leveraged and easy to facilitate and spur the conversation at home? How do I actually create an events calendar and, and really make sure that everything that we do is inspiring generosity in our community and building relationships, right? And again, you can see that was exactly at the same time that Charlie and I started our music initiative. It was like, yeah, this it's great. We want to make a difference with the kids. What does it look like if we get purposeful? We get uncomfortable. We call our local education foundation and we say, this is what we're doing. We want to do it year after year after year. We're here to make a difference and move towards that. So I would just encourage you to what you're doing naturally. I'm not saying don't keep doing it. I'm saying, how do you harness that and how do you systematize it and how do you break it through to the next level? Because it's still going to be you. It's still what you love to do. You're just scaling it now. You're taking it to the next level. So I hope that nobody um, hears that you have to turn into something else or do something else. It's actually going to the core of who you are and what is deeply inside of you naturally and just taking it to the next level. And that's where it gets really exciting for each of you to bring your unique selves to that, that next purposeful level. Okay, Amy, close us out, then we're heading out. So as a former marching band mom, I want to let you know that I love your initiative. I've supported it and I love it. So um, thank you for what you guys do. That's awesome for the kids. And um, and for me, being um, being learning based is key. Um, if we're not if we're not really emphasizing that to our agents um, on really almost a daily basis on our check-ins, you know, in the morning on our power-ups, it's so, so incredibly necessary to do that because they're going to get stuck. They're going to have moments where they're just, I just don't know how to do this anymore, <laughs> even though they know that what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and sometimes just that one class, that one participation, that one thing can give them that aha to just keep them going. So, um, so I, that's, that's something that's just so key to me. That's right. Y'all are awesome. Think through today. What are you going to put into action, right? Let's not learn for knowing sake. Let's learn for doing sake and go out there and make a difference. Um, have a great day, y'all. And I'll see you tomorrow for our last day. Bye. Good morning, everyone. It's our last day of the six, six personal perspectives. Um, we have covered self-mastery. We've covered the 80-20, E to P, being learning-based. And today we get to talk about limiting beliefs and being accountable. These are our last two of the six personal perspectives. Um, so let me jump into share screen while all of our folks are logging on. Good morning to everyone I haven't. I have wait waiting room 
right. I don't know who my coaching team person is, but if there's a way for you to take the waiting room rights away from me and let everybody in, that would be awesome. Um, can y'all see my screen, Nick? Can you see it? Great. Okay. So uh, as a reminder, well, let me do this. Actually, I want to do something fun first. If you're in your car, keep your eyes on the road. I just want to ask everybody a question. Um, and I just want you to answer not with your zoom hand, but your real hand. Raise your hand if you can draw. Awesome. Awesome. And I appreciate the real hand, the zoom hand and the real hand. <laughs> So here's what's interesting. Um, if you asked a classroom of first graders if they could draw, literally every single hand in the room is gonna go up, right? Whereas I think in our room, that was about 50%. That was about half of us said that we could draw. And I think as adults, this is because you all might have thought you heard me say, raise your hand if you can draw well. And I asked, raise your hand if you can draw. So it's this interesting thing where we understand that we have certain limiting beliefs as adults that maybe we didn't have as children. And we attach qualifiers to them. Um, and what's interesting about our brains, we know this, is that when we think something is true, we actually then make it true. You've heard the bold law that what you focus on expands. Well, that goes in every direction, right? Um, Henry Ford said, if you think you can do a thing or think you can't do a thing, you're right. So I'll jump back to my screen now and just it's this idea that high achievers remove beliefs from their thinking that hold them back. We've got to be really clear in our mind about what we're focusing on because we can slip into thoughts like I don't have enough time for training or I can't be successful in this market or I can't devote X number of hours to my big rocks, my 20%, my lead gen. Whereas high achievers, they're gonna flip that into unlimiting beliefs that are gonna fuel their success. Like, well, if I put in time for the training, I'm actually gonna reap some long-term benefits in my business. Or you know what? A shifted market is the very opportunity for me to gain market share. Or last, you know what? I can't afford to miss three hours working on my big rocks because my big rocks are my purpose, my priority, and my future. So I had some serious limiting beliefs getting into real estate. Y'all may or may not know that I was a professional dancer about three lifetimes ago. And I have a BFA in dance, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Dance from the University of Texas in Austin. Um, I dance professionally with Ballet Dallas in their corps de ballet all through high school. And then through college was performing not only with a local company in Austin, Texas, but also a touring company based out of Seattle, Washington. Got to tour all over the place. Um, and it was a beautiful season and yet, what I then brought into real estate was this limiting belief that I, I'm just a dancer. I can't run a business. And I held on to that for a really long time. And taking and thinking through the six personal perspectives, I was able to flip it and say, you know what? Because of my determination and the work ethic that I developed standing at the ballet bar six days a week for 15 plus years, I can outwork anyone. And I can certainly outwork anyone in real estate. 
I then went on the journey to become a KWU approved trainer. And at first, my limiting belief was, I'm a dancer. Dancers don't talk. <laughs> they don't speak. They're silent on stage. I'm not supposed to be speaking. I'm not supposed to be talking, right? But then I flipped it and decided to say, you know what, because of my dance background, I have the confidence in front of people. And I have the ability to memorize words, just like I did choreography. So I wonder for you, is the very thing that you're having a limiting belief actually the thing that is going to power you and fuel you? Because I thought what was, I'm just a dancer, I can't run a business, actually has propelled me into having this business that I'm so proud of and is a real business. And the transition of becoming a teacher, speaker, trainer was not that I can't because dancers don't talk, but I can because all of those years on stage prepared me for it. So I wonder what that might be for you. Um, sometimes we aren't even aware, though, of our background beliefs, right? And so this is where going back to the first perspective of self-mastery is so important. Being aware, what are those background beliefs that are almost default? Like they just run and you haven't even acknowledged that they're running. Because um, we are a product of our belief system, right? So there's the background beliefs, but then there's the beliefs that you surround yourself with. And I know you all have heard this, but we are the product of the five people we surround ourselves with and what they believe about us. Not only who they are and what they believe about themselves, but what they believe about us. Um, I have had the distinct privilege for the last three and a half years to have a small group of women come to our home gym and do yoga. It's we're pretty consistently twice a week at 7 a.m. So if you see me miss an early morning meeting, it's because I'm in the back house in the studio doing yoga with some of the most remarkable women. These are the women who like we consider the yoga studio church as much as anything else. And the way we show up for each other is with transparency, vulnerability, and speaking affirmations and beliefs into each other before we, you know, start in child's pose. But we're, I'm talking about a woman who will be the first Jewish female playwright to have a show on Broadway in decades. Her show is debuting this summer talking about the woman who wrote the book Target 100. She's a high level health and wellness coach who coached Jennifer Hudson, Jessica Simpson, Katie Couric, and Charles Barkley. Talking about a woman who starred as Cinderella on Broadway. Cinderella, <laughs> as well as maybe a dozen other Broadway shows. Talking about one of the leading female Broadway directors in the industry. And then there's me and I always go, I can't believe y'all let me in this room. Who are you surrounding yourself with and how are their beliefs about themselves and about you impacting how you then dismantle your limiting beliefs and make them unlimited beliefs? Because what you truly believe about yourself is who you're going to be. If you believe that you are good and true, you will be. And when you keep your promises to yourself, that is affirmation and that is um, just a beautiful loop to help you in this dismantling. Say the things that you aspire to, to yourself and that you want to become. Say them out loud. So let's jump in now to being accountable, which is kind of the final, the final perspective. And y'all aren't going to be able to read this slide, so I'm going to read it to you. The blue side is um, one way of navigate, one worldview, and the red side is the accountable way. Now, life is going to show up for every single one of us. And 
how we respond is what matters. And listen, we're all going to feel like victims at some point, myself included, every single one of us. So here's the thing, life shows up and the victim in us is going to not seek reality, is going to um, not ask any questions and go into ignorance, where the accountable person will seek reality, want to gain awareness and ask, what is the real situation? The victim is going to fight reality and go into denial and say, well, that's not the way it is. That's that's not how I see it. Well, that's just your perception. Whereas the accountable person is going to acknowledge reality and seek clarity and say, "Okay, this is the way it is. I've got it. I'll see what's going on. The victim is going to blame others and go into projection and say, if everybody would just do their job. And well, it's not my fault, it's yours. And this market's to blame and the economy's to blame. And why didn't you do something about it? Whereas the accountable person is going to own it and bring energy and focus and say, if it's meant to be, it is up to me. And what do I want? Because I have to go do something about it. This is my responsibility. The victim is going to use personal excuses and deflect. Say, well, nobody told me. It's not my job. I did my part. I was never given a chance. That doesn't work here. I did what I was supposed to do and it didn't work. Well, I just can't think of anything else to do. Whereas the accountable person is going to find solutions, find possibilities and say, okay, what are the options? How can I get what I want and what can I do? The victim is going to wait and hope. They sit in a place of resignation. Well, if it was meant to be, it would have happened. Let's just wait and see. We've done all we can do. So time will tell. It's out of my hands. Proof will be in the pudding versus the accountable person who creates an action plan. Says, okay, let's go get started. Time's up, let's go. This is what I am going to do. Let's do it and let's get on with it. So accountability we often talk about is about coaching, but really it starts with us, right? And acknowledging that we, first must seek reality. We must acknowledge the reality. We must own that reality, find solutions, and then get on with it with our action plan. It is about an attitude, it is an approach, and it is about your entire life. That everything in our lives is a result of your choices and your actions that you own your life. I remember um, just last week being in Austin with Gary and he told a story about, um, he went to see a therapist after the divorce from his first wife. And after the first session, the therapist said, Gary, that's the last time we're gonna talk about your ex-wife. Gary said, what are you talking about? And he goes, that's the last time we're talking about your ex-wife. It's not about her. Um, You strike me as maybe a somewhat traditional guy. Who asked who to get married? Did she ask you to marry her or did you ask her to marry you? And Gary said, yeah, I I asked her to marry me. He said, exactly. So what we're going to focus on is that reality and what caused you to ask someone like her to marry you and let's heal through that. Let's heal through you. That is a level of accountability that Gary took for having chosen a partner who then, and y'all, he tells the story publicly from the stage, had an affair with his boss and left him. And he is no longer blaming her. He's acknowledging, I'm accountable. I asked that woman to marry me. What does that mean? And how do I need to heal through that? 
Now, you're often going to get into these conversations um, more likely with coaches um, or you're going to have these conversations with your team members. So what does an accountable um, conversation look like? And you all have seen this before, but just to review it, when you're having a conversation, you first ask for the reminder of what was your goal. Now, obviously, when you go into a coaching conversation, you always ask for permission first, right? So we don't just jump in and try to start pulling um, deep things out of people without their permission because they not may not be in a in a place to receive that. Um, but this is with the assumption that it is um, a coaching session and and you've got uh, permission to to wade in, so to speak. How, what was your goal? Okay, how did you do? And how do you feel about that? Whether they did good or bad, how do they feel about that? And based on how you did, what is your goal and what do you need to do now? Because the goal will change and what their actions around it will need to change. And then it's the question, is there anything that might keep you from being able to do that? And they can work through um what those obstacles might be and you can ask if you needed training or support to do this what might it be because authorship is ownership and when you ask somebody what they need and they author what they need then you have a much higher likelihood that they will receive that support or when they go to that training that they will receive that information and be able to implement it into their lives. Authorship is ownership. And so through this conversation, it's crucial um, that they are authoring how, what their new action plan is going to be. So again, I want you to think about um, who the people in your life are that you're accountable to. Um, and in the six personal perspectives curriculum, they really think about, do you have four accountability partners? Do you have a financial accountability partner, a spiritual accountability partner, a physical accountability partner, and a business accountability partner? So for financial, we've got Becca. Yay for Becca. <laughs> for spiritual, are you leaning into either your your pastor, your priest, your guru, um, your rabbi, who is your spiritual accountability partner? In terms of physical, I actually have the physical accountability of my yoga gals and I've hardwired physical accountability into our team. If you're on my Instagram, you saw me post yesterday was workout Wednesday. We show up and we work out together on Wednesday. I bring in that trainer. So what it's not a person. It is an action plan and an activity with people that create that accountability and then business who's your business accountability partner maybe it's norm maybe it's your maps coach i've had a maps coach for a decade now but who are those partners for you in the one minute we have left <laughs> it's just a reminder and i want you to think about the one thing that you want to implement from each of these perspectives as it pertains to the goal that you set on monday what is the one thing that you want to do in terms of self mastery? The 80 20 principle. Going from E to P, being learning based, removing those limiting beliefs, and being accountable. Now, here's my last request from y'all I am a KWU approved trainer and I am behind on reviews. I need your help. I know not everybody on here is a human. We have a lot of robots, but if I could get half of the 26 participants, so 13 reviews from the time we spent together this week, I would be so unbelievably grateful because it is part of our process um, as being KWU trainers that we get reviews regularly on our curriculum, six personal perspectives being one of them. So please take the time to fill that out. Put the feedback in. I want to get better. I hope that I have this week added value for you all. I'd love it not only in the feedback on the eval, but shoot me an email. Let me know what you got from this week together um, and what some of those one things are so that we know that this was education for, for doing, 
not just for knowing. Thank you all so much. Have a great week and um, happy Thursday. Bye, everybody.